going to talk about generation and how to put some of those electrons into the, the uh, grid that Gary was just talking about. And the work I'm going to talk about in the technology was really developed by a bunch of very energetic young students. And the faculty involved, including myself, were really there just to kind of keep up with them. So we're fortunate to live on this magnificent planet that was where we were given a lot of natural resources. And we live in this very thin strip of atmosphere that's about as thick as from here to Los Angeles. And in that atmosphere, we've had amazing, amazing prosperity. And the prosperity was made possible because we had abundant energy sources. And if nature would have given us energy sources that didn't produce CO2, we wouldn't be talking about energy efficiency. We wouldn't be talking about the things that we're hearing about today. And in fact, all of our prosperity was made possible because we had abundant, low-cost fossil fuels. The reason we're here today is because of that. And I believe that globally, the future's prosperity will be dependent upon nuclear power and low-cost uh, renewables. How we get there, though, is the challenge. And we have an intermediate a problem today, which is the fact that fossil fuels are finite, number one. And it, even if they weren't environmentally uh, challenging, we would be running out of them at, at some point. And the risk for this is increasing. Most of the CO2 going into the environment is put in by nature, but a lot of it's from us. And what we've seen is this increase in, in uh, atmospheric CO2 that has gone unabated except for economic recession, despite lots and lots of concern. And I like to point to my, my daughter, what she does when she has a problem. She holds her breath until she turns blue. And really, that's what we're doing. And we haven't made really much progress at all. So I'm not a climate scientist. And so I'm going to ask the people who I think actually care a lot about climate, and that's really the insurance companies. It's not the scientists, but the insurance companies who have to pay for damage. And this data is from Swiss Re, and Swiss Re insures the insurance companies. And so they have money to lose if they get it wrong, and they're looking at their losses in time, and they're going up. And it's just data. And these are the guys you should really believe, because if they're worried about it, we should be worried about it. And the problem is that the poor, who are oftentimes not insured, get the brunt of the of the, of the damage. It's not going to be the wealthy. They'll move, they're insured, they'll do what they need to do to be well off, but it's the poor who will take the brunt of environmental consequences of carbon dioxide. Now economics will always determine what we use for our fuel source, and if you look back, we were a coal and oil economy primarily in the early 2000s, and we evolved to natural gas for one reason. It wasn't because we cared about CO2, and we saw earlier that our CO2 in the US has gone down, but that's because we've transitioned from coal to natural gas because it was cheaper, not because we cared about the environment. Had it not been cheaper, people should ask, had we not found low-cost shale gas, what would we have done? The next fuel economy will be determined by economics, not by anything else. And we don't really know what that is. Conventional wisdom says that we're going to stop using fossil fuels. And what I want to talk about today is whether that's even possible. Can we use fossil fuels to help us get to the, the, uh, the future? And really, should we stop using them if we can use them in a smarter way? Now, a few people know that the, the person who discovered methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, was Alessandro Volta. Here he was poking around in northern Italy and found this flammable gas in the marshes. And it's something that's enormously abundant. And I would predict that it's going to be the most important molecule for the next century that will determine our prosperity, certainly in the United States, if not the world. There's lots of it. It's everywhere. People who saw the New York Times a few weeks ago saw an article about how it's found basically everywhere. And natural gas is found on planets. There's lakes the size of the Great Lakes on the moon of Saturn uh, filled with liquid methane. So lots and lots of methane is around. We find we can produce it very, at a very low cost. And interestingly, we have a huge resource already here in the United States of an inter interstate pipeline system which contains high pressure natural gas. And if you count the amount of uh, stored energy in that natural gas pipeline, it's the largest battery on Earth and you could never store that much energy in any kind of battery system. A typical LNG tanker carries in one load enough liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas to generate 
100 megawatts for a year. So it's, that's your wood pile for a power station. So we have this enormous infrastructure, and the question is, can we make use of it? Today, we produce about 2.8 trillion kilograms of natural gas together with coal and, and oil, and that's our 9.5 trillion kilograms of carbon that feeds our economy, generates a global GDP of $80 trillion, and makes our way of life quite wonderful. Unfortunately, we produce 35 trillion kilograms of CO2. The technology that I'm going to talk about is a way to transition from what we do today to a world where we can increase our gas production by a reasonable amount, something that's doable, and use the natural gas as a source of hydrogen and solid carbon. So this is something we could do today. We have the technology. We have the infrastructure already there. So I'm going to talk about why pyrolysis, which is this conversion of methane, the primary component of natural gas, into carbon and hydrogen, is the best option for making CO2-free hydrogen. I'll say a little bit about the chemistry and why the technology developed here makes this possible in unique chemical environments. So if you look at what we do on Earth, on Earth, all of the hydrogen that we have in nature comes from water. And basically, nature takes the electrons around oxygen and water and some of the oxygen in CO2 and transfers it to make hydrocarbons. This is methane, where now that oxygen's electron density has been moved around the carbon. And so we're storing the electrochemical potential of that uh, electron around the carbon atom. It's kind of a storage, just like a battery. And it makes fo other fossil fuels in the same way. So this carbon's reduced state is where we've stored the energy. And nature did that for free. They simply used photosynthesis to transfer those electrons from oxygen to, to this carbon. And they also, it also produces reduced, if you will, oxygen for us to breathe. Now, commercially, people talk about using water to make hydrogen, and that's really energy storage. You're taking water, you put energy into it, and you can split it into hydrogen oxygen and store the electron around hydrogen. That, it's a storage molecule, so you're storing that energy that was previously around carbon or oxygen, you're storing it around the hydrogen. What we do in refine, oil refineries is we refine the natural resources like methane, and we refine those into fuels that have that stored chemical potential. So today we make hydrogen from what's called steam methane reforming, so we take the carbon's hydrogen and we move it to a hydrogen. Unfortunately, with the existing technology, we also make CO2. That's the downside. The technology we'll I'll talk about today is we'll take the same car carbon's electron and move it to hydrogen, but not produce any, any CO2. So you get about half the energy you would have had if you would have burned the, the uh, methane in the first place, but now it's stored around hydrogen, which can burn without producing CO2. All of these things need energy input. So with hydro when you're doing electrolysis, you're putting as much energy into it as you get when you burn the hydrogen that you make. So this is really just a battery. Whereas if you're using fuel refining, if you will, you're taking methane and you're transferring that electron to this hydrogen, you don't use as much energy input as you store in the hydrogen uh, that you're producing. So the thermodynamics favor so having nature to pay for making this methane in the first place, and we're, we're leveraging that work that we got for free in our fuel. Now, if you look at today, the economics say the cheapest way to make hydrogen, and it is done today with natural gas, to make hydrogen at about a dollar a kilogram. This technology works the best because for one methane, you make four hydrogens, because you're taking some of the hydrogen from water. You need to put more energy in per hydrogen molecule, but energy is pretty cheap. So this is the way you make hydrogen today for commercial use, is by steam methane reforming. Pyrolysis takes, more, takes less energy per hydrogen, but you make less hydrogen. Electrolysis doesn't work for commercial production of large-scale hydrogen because the electricity that you're using is the same energy content as the hydrogen, and this is just too expensive. If you want to do it for, with CO, a CO2-free technology, Electrolysis still loses because of the high cost of electricity. If you're going to sequester the CO2 you make from steam methane reforming, that's also very expensive. So this is the technology that would be the cheapest if you care about CO2. If you don't care about CO2, you cannot beat steam methane reforming for hydrogen. But if you care about CO2 and you're willing to pay for it, pyrolysis is the, best, sec is the second best way of making hydrogen cheaper. Now the reaction is, is endothermic and it's 
equilibrium limited. So if you go to high pressure, which is what you need for a commercial process, you'll get your equilibrium conversion to this product is limited. The rates need to be very high in order to make a commercial plant. So you need a, a reaction rate of about a mole per meter cube per second. So you have to get to equilibrium fast, and you want the equilibrium to be as high as possible. So you want high pressure, and you want a lot of conversion. The chemistry is pretty trivial. It looks, all you have to do is strip some hydrogen off of methane. So it looks pretty easy. It's not particularly far uphill energetically. And we know a lot about it. It's been studied for centuries almost. And we know all the details of the intermediate steps. It's been published for a long time. The problem with this is, so it's simple. Why won't we do it? Is that the problem is that we make carbon. And it fills up the reactor. So the reactors get filled with carbon. And then what do you do? You burn out the carbon, and you make CO2. So you just defeat the whole, the whole purpose. And there was commercial plants made like this in the 60s by UOP that produced hydrogen commercially this way. And they just burned off the, ca the carbon and made CO2. So it wasn't to produce cl clean hydrogen. It was to produce hydrogen and make some money. So our technology leverages what we know about high temperature liquids. If you look at production of metals at high temperature, you can remove the dross or the impurities in the metal from the top pretty easily on a commercial scale. So the idea was pretty simple. If we take a high temperature liquid, we can react the methane in this high temperature liquid, make carbon, which can then be removed in the liquid, just like it's removed in a steel process. The idea is that you're going to have a bubble. As you bubble this gas through this high temperature liquid, there's going to be gas phase reactions. But unfortunately, even though there's a lot of collisions in the gas phase, this reaction is very slow. So you need to do something on the surface to make the reaction rate as high as you can to make the reactor size commercially viable. And so you need to know something about the surface chemistry. And this is why it was academically interesting. It's interesting to people who work in catalysis of what happens on surfaces. How do molecules react? And here's a, a liquid surface, which is even more interesting. What happens on this liquid surface to this molecule? So that's what we were interested in. So we started to look at high temperature metals, because we had done a lot of work with solid metals, just like the ones that coke up. And so we looked at alloys that were molten at temperatures that we could control in a reactor, and how, they, how reactive were they. And there's only a limited number that don't make solid carbides uh, and allow the separation of, of the uh, solid carbon. So two terrific students worked on this, and they looked at a bunch of different alloys. And they found interesting things from an academic point of view, depending on which, which sets of atoms you mix together. We had different activities. And some of them were really quite active and allowed you to separate the carbon from the hydrogen. Different, different melts made different kinds of carbon. So the, all of the melts were pretty active, because it's at high temperature. But the carbons that they made were quite different. So some carbons might be good for batteries. Some might, carbons might be good for tires. They make different kinds of carbons in different melts. And that was interesting to us, again, from an academic point of view. And looking at it from an academic point of view, we had to understand why. And so having some great help from theorists here at Santa Barbara, we understood why was it that we added nickel to bismuth. Bismuth is inactive. Nickel is quite active for catalysts. We thought for sure the nickel would be the active component. In fact, what the theory showed us was the nickel was activating this normally inactive bismuth. If we put platinum in here, it didn't do the same thing. Platinum's a great catalyst. It's expensive. You throw it in, and you just wasted all your platinum, because the theory tells us that the platinum didn't do such a good job of, interact, uh, of activating the bismuth. So there's lots of interesting theory that helped us predict which melts would be active and which ones wouldn't. We did lots of characterization in fairly long terms. And here you can see it. Once you get used to working in 1,000 degrees C, it's not such a big deal. He's pulling this uh, reactor out. You can see the carbon collecting on top of the metal. And the bu gas just bubbles up. And we learned that the pressure increases, increases the, the uh, reaction rate, does all kinds of things that we can describe so that if you wanted to design a commercial reactor, you could do that. And we scaled up to a full meter long reactor and showed that we could convert almost all the methane to hydrogen and carbon in, a, in only a meter. So a commercial reactor could be several meters. So from a practical point of view, this is doable. There's one catch which I'll come back to. In parallel, we were looking at molten salts. And molten salts have lots of advantages in industry because we've used them for a lot of processes. Sulfuric acid is the most common inorganic chemical made, to, made on Earth. And it's made with a molten salt process. So molten salts in, in chemical processes are well known. Typically, they're in oxidation processes, not 
processes where you have a reducing environment, and so which is what the pyrolysis is. So we had to go back through the search and find which which salts would work. Carbonates and nitrates won't work. You don't want to put nitrates in with hydrocarbons, or else you have an explosion. Uh, but so halides were quite interesting to us, and they've been used in high-temperature nuclear reactors. So the simple salts, like potassium chloride, sodium chloride, and those simple salts all were active, but they weren't particularly highly active. They were more active than just having a, a gas phase bubble. And we, we carefully characterized these things, and when you think about why they're active, that's in itself somewhat interesting, because you have a, most people think of salt surfaces be, as being pretty dead because they don't have any places for electrons to go in and out, and that's why even at 1,000 degrees, a simple salt is pretty clear. It's not emitting anything because it doesn't have any uh, states in the band gap, as they say. If you put defects into insulators, then you put states into the band gap, and those are where you can do chemistry. So when you have these salts, this is where you're bubbling. You know, this should go both of those. I tested this last time. Okay, well, let me just uh, go back one. There you go. So if you look at argon bubbling through a simple salt, the salt is clear even though it's 1,000 degrees. If you bubble methane through a simple salt, you can see it starts to become colored, and that's because the impurities are going into the salt and giving rise to the glow. This is really interesting from a fundamental point of view. Why is the carbon soluble in molten salts? There's also all kinds of interesting practical uh, issues with that. But it allowed us to start to study these interactions. What was happening at the interface of this bubble? And so we set up an experiment where we could look at a single bubble. So this bubble was captured on a little cap, and you're watching the carbon form on the inside of the bubble. You can see the little uh, particles there as they form on the inside surface of this bubble. So the gas is reacting on the surface and forming this carbon, which then ag aggregates, and you can just filter it out of this liquid and take it out of the reactor. So we found that there's a lot of divalent salts, not the simple salts, but the divalent salts are really very active. You can get 40% conversion in just a few inches. So very high activity in different, more complex salts. Some beautiful work that was done by Doyoung Kang showed that these manganese chloride mixed salts had very high activity, and there was a fundamental reason for that. We know a lot about manganese chemistry. Manganese is a terrific uh, a catalytic center for activating carbon-hydrogen bonds, and he was able to figure out the actual theory for why it was that that CH bond was being activated on these mag manganese chloride mixtures. And you can see they're quite active. And they have this interesting minimum energy, which means they have the highest rate at a mixture of about 50-50 potassium chloride and manganese chloride. And that happens to be conveniently the place where the manganese chloride has the most access to the atom, the, the catalytic site, for these methane molecules. So there's a real fundamental reason why this is a particularly active salt. The other thing that's interesting about manganese as compared to the simple salts is it makes a very graphitic carbon, the kind that you would want for a battery. So the, with this manganese-based salts, we had now an active species that produced a carbon that we might even sell rather than get no value for it, and it had a very, very high reaction rate. So we could make a small reactor that would make a carbon product that was valuable. So we've looked through a whole bunch of different salts. And above this line, they're too slow. So if you just took the gas phase reaction in a bubble, it's too slow. It's up in this zone that's not commercially viable. Everything below that line, though, is a commercially viable. It means that you could build a reactor that's small enough and cheap enough to make the process work economically. And so we found a whole bunch of different choices. And each one of those will have a different materials and carbon product uh, associated with it. So you'd have to look at those individually to find out what the optimal design was. Now, for all of this, we make a lot of carbon. So if you make, you make about a million tons per year per gigawatt thermal power. Now, if we were just making thermal power from burning it, all of that, remember, goes up into the atmosphere. So it's way better to have a pile of carbon that you can put someplace than to have it go up in the atmosphere. The whole global market for carbon is about 50 million tons a year. Mostly the high value stuff is tires. Now, tires aren't a good place to put it because they burn 80% of the tires. So it's going to go to CO2 anyway. What you want to do is put it in a, a building material. You can add it to concrete and get a little value for it for that. But really, at the end of the day, if we're wildly successful, it's got to go back in the ground. It's got to go back 
but we know how much it takes. It takes about 15, 15 but it's the reverse of coal mining. <laughs> I'll come back and make a comment about that later. So all kinds of different carbons are possible, and we can, under different melt conditions with different salts, we can see a variety of different structures of carbon, and we can tune them to some extent by the reaction conditions. One of the real challenges with the liquid metals, even though they were very active, is to get all the metal out of the carbon. And even if you look at mine graphite, which they use commercially, it has a lot of impurities in it, but these, this would be unacceptable. We couldn't lose that much metal in the carbon, and that's what was one of the reasons that drove us to salt. Nazanin Rahim, he found it had a really clever idea. She said, well, why don't we put molten metal on the bottom of a molten salt and bubble them up together so that the molten salt can kind of clean the carbon. As the bubble moves through the salt phase, it'll pull the, the metal out and return it to the dense metal phase. And this is some really nice work uh, that d does, in fact, give you much higher purity uh, carbon. But again, that's still too high. Even if you lose a tenth of a weight percent of nickel in your carbon, that's too much to economically make it viable. You want to use something that's low cost, and that again drives us back to salts. Now salts are pretty interesting, and this is where a lot of our technology lies, is in understanding the interactions with different carbons and different salts. For example, this is a, a salt that has almost no interaction at all with the carbon. It, it just admissible two-phase system, which is good for separation, but bad for maybe growing other kinds of carbon. This is a different salt mixture where you can see all kinds of interesting mixtures between these. And understanding that has been a lot of the research that we've done is understanding how those uh, processes and how those interactions occur. Now in a bubble pumping system, we can bubble lift the salt up and move it through a filtering system to pull out the carbon. You can see here the carbon's aggregating in the, in the salt and you can just put it on a filter and pull it out of the reactor in a continuous way. So you can imagine how this might be scaled up to serve it as a commercial uh, process. We've looked at how it might look economically. If you really scale this up using what we know about blast furnaces and high temperature processes in industry today, we can go ahead and build an economic model that says, how does this look compared to alternatives? And it turns out it looks pretty good. Now it's hard to beat the use of natural gas to, at burning it for heat. That's extremely cheap heat. It's very hard to beat a combined cycle natural gas turbine to make electricity. Even with pretty high carbon taxes, this is the cheapest way we know today to make electricity and heat on a global scale. Maybe certain niche environments, it's different, but this is the way we'll, we're going to make heat and electricity while natural gas is available at low cost. Pyrolysis, though, benefits from the fact that it doesn't make CO2. So if you're going to make heat at a relatively small CO2 tax, which is by the way, lower than what California does today. So California already has an effective carbon tax that's higher than $75. We can beat pyrolysis for heat, and we can beat pyrolysis or uh, methane combustion for electricity uh, today in California or Germany where they have an effective CO2 tax. Without a CO2 tax, you cannot beat natural gas. Now, vehicles that run on hydrogen, if you just drive, go down to four, po or is it five points? Whatever the number of points it is down here in Lacumbra, there's a hydrogen filling station, and you'll see the hydrogen there is about 15 bucks a kilogram or so, and these Marais are available. You can go buy them today. There, there is a hydrogen infrastructure that's being enlarged, so you can buy these. More importantly, from our point of view, is you have to replace coal plants. I mean, coal plants are causing an enormous amount of CO2. A uh, one gigawatt electric uh, coal plant, you're putting 1,000 tons per hour of CO2 into the atmosphere. You're driving these coal trains to these plants. If you ever go to a coal plant, you'll just see a continuous unit train going in, into the coal station. Our vision is to reverse that, is we'll make a plant that's burning natural gas-derived hydrogen. So we have a natural gas pipeline coming in. We'll use the same infrastructure to take the carbon back to the coal mine. So the grandson is going to be refilling the hole that the grandfa <laughs> grandfather dug. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's, it, you, you, these people need jobs. And having them as part of the solution, just like having the, the uh, fossil fuel industry as part of the solution is a way better position than to make them the enemy. This would also make use of a lot of infrastructure. You could basically use the same grid connection, the same rail lines. You can use the same infrastructure that's there today. So UCSB has spun out a little company to look into this and try to raise some money to commercialize it. We can go to a Series A financing and build a prototype that we think could be a thousand or hundred or so kilowatts. 
the, the first market would be to make electricity, because in California, that particular market has an advantage if you're low CO2, and it's dispatchable 24-7, so we don't have to worry about uh, batteries. So we started off with this from a purely academic point of view, thinking, oh, this is interesting. Let's look at methane reactions on molten surfaces, and let's look at how catalysis works. Sure, it happens. We learned there's a lot of details, and I didn't talk about the intermediates that go on and how the intermediates interact with the surface. You saw the little picture. So it's really quite interesting in how the interactions of these developing macromolecules occur, uh, interact with the surface. But all of that ends up contributing to what the final carbon product is and how you clean it up and how you take it out of the reactor. We know that with certain melts, the hydrogen is somewhat soluble in it. So it helps us pull the equilibrium forward so at high pressure, we can actually run these things at very high conversion. So it makes possible a commercial uh, process. So lots of people went into this work. Uh, and actually, I should really point out this, this large group of undergraduates. These guys really did the bulk of it. They're here on the nights and weekends, and they really did an enormous amount of work, and we just tried to keep up with them. We were appreciative of all the, the money we received from uh, federal agencies and some money recently from Shell. Um, also, I want to point out Richard Bach, who's the glass blower here at UCSB. He's the most important part per person on the team. This guy is a valuable resource. He should get a special endowed chair, because it, without him, we could never do this. So with that, I will uh, take any questions.